Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I hope you had a very pleasant, pleasant dinner last night and a good rest. Today we have a very busy day. We have uh, four tracks in the morning, concurrent tracks. You are in one of them. And this afternoon we have uh, plenaries as well. And we have a surprise for the social event tonight as well. <laughs> okay, now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Judith Bishop. She is uh, the director of the computer science uh, theme uh, within Microsoft Research Connections. And she will be the first uh, presenter of this session. And then she will be chairing the whole track, the software engineering track. So please join me welcoming Dr. Judith Bishop. Thank you, Jaime, and I'm delighted to be here in Mexico. It's my first time in Mexico, and I have found it absolutely wonderful. I've visited all the great places on this side of the country. Of course, there are many great places on the other side I've still got to visit. So what I want to talk to you uh, today is about software engineering. And the title of the talk came from a survey that came up just about a month ago where they said software engineering was the best job in 2012. So <laughs> this was, of course, one survey among many surveys, but I think it's very encouraging for us in computer science uh, to find out that this kind of thing happens because it means we can at least tell uh, prospective students and so on that this is a job that you can go into. However, Let's look at the reasons that they used in order to decide this. Of course, they were not technical reasons. They were reasons related to job satisfaction and so forth. You know, how much money you earn, whether you can have a, um, a, a low level of stress. I assume that means a, a low level of stress, not a high level of stress. And whether the work environment was very good, clearly in the picture, which accompanied this uh, article, the, the work environment was pretty cool, uh, similar to here. So I think that this was a good uh, starting point for a talk. But clearly in my talk, I'm going to be somewhat more technical. I want to start off with a little bit of history about some large efforts in software engineering that you'd be familiar with. Many people are not really familiar with the Microsoft ecosystem. They might be more familiar with what's gone on in other large ecosystems over the last 10 years, and two of them are Eclipse and Java. That came up through other big companies and big communities. I was very much involved in the Java community myself when I was a professor, and it was very interesting how things went. So people used to work in those communities, and they had um, uh, ways of getting together and integrating their code. However, in Microsoft, we have a slightly different way of doing things. In particular, one of the things in Microsoft Connections, which is the part of Microsoft Research that I work with, is we do want to collaborate with universities. So we have various ways of collaborating. And here's a whole list of them. Also, why do we do that? Why is it important to collaborate with universities? I've often asked myself this question. And part of it is that we're a small organization, Microsoft Research. Well, small in terms of the bigger picture, large in terms of any other research organization. We're over a 1,000 people now. Uh, but if we collaborate, we get to be 10,000. And that's fantastic. Then you can imagine what we would be able to do in terms of projects and so forth. And it keeps us on track because we have people verifying what we're doing 
amplifying what we're doing. And of course, we then can catch and support the leaders of tomorrow. And that's a great thing that we do. One of the people here today is Harold Javid. He's a very important person to talk to because he runs our programs for the faculty fellows and so on. And there's a picture of the latest ones uh, that have just come out. There are some amazing numbers of uh, our collaborations that have gone on. These are some of the recent numbers. Um, we've had more than 25,000 scientists come to our events and more than 1,000 interns come every year to Microsoft to work on our projects. So those are young people who come and work on the uh, software engineering that we do. And I'm going to highlight one of the projects from one of my interns in what I say upcoming. Um, also, we have conferences that we sponsor, and that's part of my portfolio. And so if you're interested in that kind of thing, do come and talk to me about it. We can't sponsor every conference that's around, but we do tend to uh, also sponsor conferences in regions, and that's a big thing. So finally, before I get on to the whole software engineering, this is what I do in my theme. So we have different themes, as Tony pointed out yesterday. We have five of them at the moment. And the computer science theme spans areas that are applicable to the people in our theme. And we currently have software engineering, semantic computing, mobile computing. We had a wonderfully um, comprehensive talk by Victor Ball yesterday about mobile computing. Uh, also, parallelism and concurrency. And this year, we've got a big summer school in Russia on that. Unfortunately, it's not available to people who don't speak Russian. So <laughs> you can't sign up for that. Uh, programming languages and, of course, the community interaction that I've been telling you a bit about. So why do we want to actually look at this whole software engineering thing from the point of view of collaboration? These are some recent spider diagrams. And if you can't really see the words on it, don't worry. I'm going to blow it up in the next slide. But this was work that came out of the um, uh, National Science, not the, uh, the Academy of Science in the US. And what it highlighted was that between the period of 1996 and 2011, collaboration between countries has increased dramatically. So in other words, scientists are collaborating more and more and more. Now, if you're going to be collaborating, as Tony pointed out in his keynote address yesterday, you need ways of assisting that collaboration. So software has to underpin it. And I'm going to discuss some of that. But let's look at these figures a little bit more to see why we need it. It's very interesting that in 1996, the USA, so what are these figures, was producing the majority of papers that were in the major conferences, Popple, PLDI, UPSLA, and PPOPP. And from the other countries shown there, which were Germany, uh, Canada, the UK, and so on, there were some papers. But the lines show you that the papers went co-authored. Fast forward, and let's fast forward to 2011. And the picture changes completely. The US is, of course, still the biggest. Well, they have the most money and the most people working in the area, so that's fine. But what's happened is that all these other countries are now interacting and collaborating, both with the US and between themselves. So, what a line indicates is that there was a paper at one of these major conferences for which there were authors that were in the same paper from different countries. Fantastic. Okay? So I think that given that, we need software engineering tools to underpin and under to support all of this uh, kind of collaboration. Just to show why Microsoft is very, very keen on this as well. Uh, Microsoft Research is very highly ranked 
in the top CS research organizations. Uh, there is another talk. I hope it's not on at the same time, but if you can go to it and don't want to attend this session, it's um, later on maybe, or tomorrow, about Microsoft Academic Search. And this is Microsoft Academic Search, and it's showing that the top computer science organizations include Microsoft, IBM, AT&T Labs, and Google. So it's not just universities that are pushing in the research effort. One more of these. In software engineering, so there's software engineering there, uh, Microsoft is in fact top. So it's the work that we do in our lab really is something extraordinary. I cannot show you all of it. I'm going to show you just a few things that will be, um, I hope, nice to take home. And these are them. So this is the talk. I want to give you an example of software engineering in the large. You've already seen some of those in the keynote. This is one more. Then software in the browser. Software in the social experience. And my earlier slides led up to that, because I was saying that if you're going to collaborate with other people and across countries and so on, you end up having to have a social experience, which is a little bit more than coming to a nice conference. You need real underpinning. Social aspects in the large, and then finally, software development kits. So let's get going. <coughs> the challenge. This is the challenge that Microsoft has had for a long time. We ship software, e.g. Windows, to billions of computers in the world. Uh, we wish more people would actually pay for that uh, stuff, but actually it exists in um, billions of PCs. What we want to do is make sure that any bugs that are there are reported back to us and fixed in the minimum amount of time, because then we can get that bug fix out to everybody. It's very likely that if you've got a problem, somebody else among the billions have got the same problem, so we can all share the fixes. How does that happen within Microsoft? So this is how it happens. A crash occurs on your computer. Oh dear, that's not fun. You get what's called a mini dump. So your computer automatically takes a dump of the state of the computer. It then asks you whether you will allow that mini dump to be sent to Microsoft. Now, it's really funny that a lot of people say no. I'd like to encourage you right at this minute to say yes, because the information that gets sent is going to help in the uh, bug fixing. And if it isn't sent, the bugs aren't going to get fixed as easily. So do say yes next time you get this little uh, um, pop-up. Then what happens is the information goes out to a big server and a whole section of servers. And then this is the, the, um, the cool part. There's a program or an engine called uh, Analyze. And it does a hash coding of the mini dump. And it hash codes it into a whole load of different buckets. Now, if you look at these buckets at the bottom, you'll see that the one on the right ended up with 23 million mini dumps. Oh dear, that is obviously a very popular bug. The one on the left ended up with only five. So that's an obscure bug. So you can see where this is heading. Um, we're going to then work out and send our bug fixes to the most popular bugs so that we get the most um, people satisfied the most quickly. So this engine has been working for 10 years now. It's called WER, Windows Error Reporting, and it has a, um, about 500 different heuristics in that uh, hash coding algorithm and they're more getting added each, uh, each week as the team decides, okay, there's another kind of error that they're starting to find, they need to fix that. Then what happens is that um, you get these kinds of interesting graphs, just to show you how amazingly well this works. 
This was in MS Word last year, when we brought out MS Word, it was tested out on the company's employees first. We tend to do that. It's called dog food. And the company's employees tested this program, a Microsoft Word, and there were 9,000 of them. And in the first um, three weeks, they found that the 20 buckets accounted for 50% of all the errors. So that was that analyze engine working away very fast and the bugs going to the right people to get fixed as fast as they could and to get sent back and uh, into your code as fixes. So we try very hard and to get all these bugs fixed. We fixed uh, 5,000 bugs in Windows Vista. You might say there were probably still more. Windows Vista wasn't all that popular. But there were antivirus vendors who said they'd like to buy this software from Microsoft, and they did. So in fact, the software also runs in other um, companies' uh, co code as well. And the Office 22 team managed to fix uh, about 22% of all their reports that they received in three weeks. Here's two more graphs, and then we'll finish with this section. This was an interesting one, um, a hardware bug. So once again, as Tony said yesterday, not all the bugs that Microsoft get, gets are Microsoft bugs, but they come to us because they're part of the operating system ecosystem. And this was one where there was a hardware error in certain chips, but it was showing up as a Windows bug. So we were able to track it, and as you can see, it took about nine days prior to when the bug was fixed, which is the blue line there, and then uh, there were very few reports after that, and those were clearly those machines which had not received the fix. Of course, if the manufacturer had had the software, he could have, they could have fixed it themselves as well. Lastly, uh, hmm. This um, kind of uh, software also can be used with malware. In other words, intentional bad code that is inserted into systems. And this was a, re um, a problem that occurred sometime in 2007 where there was a bug which was inserted into... Um, uh, Windows code, and as you can see, the reports went up in the millions. We had over a million reports coming in on the same thing. So that meant it could, get found, it could easily get found, and then, as you can see, the bug fix went down straight away. And this goes out globally. So... There is a paper about this. It's earlier on in the slides, so when you get the slides off the website, you'll be able to go in and read the paper and see more of the details, exactly how Analyze works and so on. And of course, it is a commercial product now as well. And it's a, a very valuable thing for Microsoft itself. So that's how uh, Microsoft Research works with the product teams to solve some of these big problems. Another thing we've been doing in our group is working with universities to try and see what are the kinds of software they really want. And I want to give you two examples. The first one, obviously, is programming languages. Now, universities are always thinking about new programming languages and how do we change our programming language, move on to the next best thing. It's always a bit of a headache to do that because... These days, uh, students have lots of different types of computers. They don't just have Microsoft computers. They might have uh, Linux or Mac operating systems, and it's necessary to kind of accommodate that. So one of the ways that one can do that is to have the software, initially anyway, running in a browser. So if we look at the stack here, in, at the bottom, one can say, all right, well, we're going to go for a particular integrated development environment, and everybody must choose 
which one they want. Let's say the whole department switches over to Eclipse, or the whole department switches over to Visual Studio. That's not really that flexible. So moving up a little bit, one could say, well, let's not worry about which uh, development environment we use, but let's standardize on the language. Well, that's also a good way to go, and most people go that way. Another way you can do it is, in fact, to say, well, we're not going to worry too much about all of that, and what we're going to do is teach principles and so on, and we'll access everything through a browser. And I'm going to show you, actually, through a demo, uh, how this works. Let's look at two examples. There are two ways of doing this browser-based software. The first way is that you have a sandbox approach. So the sandbox approach is where you access the browser and the software comes through the browser onto your computer and runs within the browser as a, um, as a piece of software there. It's a control that comes in. All the computation is done here on the client, so it's quite fast. And there is um, no additional hardware needed. You, you don't have to be online after you've already got it. It's, it's fine. The server approach is somewhat different, so you're going to get one of each here, is where you maintain a server presence. All the computation is done on the server, and uh, clearly the um, uh, advantage there is that the people who are running this kind of software can look at the usability, and that's a big advantage. The disadvantage is a little bit that it might not scale. However, we haven't found that to be a problem. The servers that we're running in Redmond for these uh, um, kinds of systems, and you saw one of them yesterday, which was Daphne, uh, don't seem to have a scalability problem at the moment. So both of these systems have advantages. This is the first one, or an example of the first kind. A language called F Sharp is a functional programming language which is used uh, by many people out there, and it's used particularly for uh, uh, financial applications, for large data applications, for accessing programs in the cloud, and so on. It's also very good as a teaching language for initial functional programming. So with that in mind, we developed this browser-based capability, which is shown here. So in the middle of the browser, you'll see that there's some programs. On the left-hand side, there's a tutorial. And on the right-hand side is the outs output from that program that's running in the middle. I'll do you a quick demo of that, and of course, there will be a demo on Friday where you can come and talk to me about it. So the software engineering aspects of this are that it is built inside a system called um, Silverlight. It's a control in there. It's built on a particular stack. The whole thing comes down into your uh, computer. It's about just over a megabyte at the moment. It's not very big. And it also uh, is deployed at the end of the day up into Windows Azure, up into the cloud, and the whole thing wraps up into the public internet. So let me show you an uh, actual example of this working. If we can switch to this machine. While they're switching the machines, I'm just going to carry on with the uh, slides. As soon as that comes on, we'll do the demo. All right? It's fine. So this is the other kind of software. This is a different one altogether. This one is called PEX for Fun. Now, the originator of PEX for Fun is possibly in the audience, Nikolai. Ah, there he is, right, right in the front. So PEX for Fun is a um, system which is a simplified version of PEX, where PEX is a unit tester which runs on top of .NET. Uh, it can be launched in various ways, but one of the more exciting ways is to launch it through the browser. So it's one of the type two that I showed you. And you can access it and you can run it. And PEX for Fun enables uh, people to write programs and then have them unit tested automatically. 
So that's quite an interesting aspect of software engineering because unit testing is very, very important uh, technique to learn and to try out. However, why it's called for fun is that this unit testing has been turned into a game by the PEX for Fun system. And the game is whether or not you pass the unit test. So let's look at it. This is what the screen looks like. At the top, you've got a little program up there. And the program is meant to do something. When you say ask PEX, which is over on the left, what comes out is a list of inputs and a list of outputs, and then whether or not the outputs conform to what the program should have produced. And then you will get error messages. So one of the error messages over here was index was outside the bounds of the array, and the other one was a hidden bug, which you have to somehow get around. So as you can see, there's Nikolai's name, and this is a technical report you can get online, which has more about PECs which hopefully we will be able to show you. So <laughs> PEX works by dynamic symbolic execution. And there it is. There's a program. And it takes the inputs. It observes what is the um, constraints and executes the um, programs for each of the inputs that it can generate. Now, there are just far too many inputs for anybody like yourself or a student or whatever to test all of these, but a computer can do it. So it solves them and it produces the observed constraints. It keeps going and eventually it will come up with a numerous types of constraints which are going to be valid or invalid. And then there's no path a left at the end of the day. So it can then uh, systematically work out what are going to be the uh, different types of um, inputs and outputs and whether or not the program that you've inputted uh, validates those. So PEX uses the cloud extensively. Everything is compiled and analyzed up in the cloud. So I like this because it looks a bit like the C. The results are shown in the browser, but the browser is not anything other than something which is used at the end. One of the nice features about the latest versions of PEX is that when you're writing programs, it does also use auto-completion. So you ha there's a pretty fancy editor in there for writing programs. You're not just writing text. You're getting a lot of help. What is auto-completion? Um, you can see there, when you're starting to write console dot something, it gives you a, a, a menu of what might be applicable. And as soon as you type a W, it'll give you the options that might be applicable. And as you continue along, it'll tell you what is available. Now, why is that useful? Because you might know, think that most of your students know Java, and Java is not one of the languages that PEX for Fun supports. PEX for Fun supports um, C Sharp, Visual Basic, and F Sharp, which is one of the languages I told you about before. So you can use this without knowing too much about C Sharp and learn a lot about unit testing. That aspect of putting all the programs up in the cloud and having them run so that you can use them is then generalized in, by the same team, uh, Nikolai's team, in this Rise for Fun program. Now, we didn't hear very much about Rise yesterday, so I just want to iterate that Rise for Fun stands for Research in Software Engineering. And it's a big group of over 40 researchers at Microsoft Research who all work in software engineering. And these um, researchers continually produce tools. And they're collected on this website called Rise for Fun. You can go in there, choose one of the tools that has something to do with something you're interested in, and just run it. If you're on the internet, you could do that right now. And 
each of the tools has different levels of tutorials, different levels of explanations, and some of them are extremely interesting. Just what you, you're after. Now, I said that with this whole collaborative software engineering thing, you really do need some kind of social experience. So, one of the ways that most people get their social experience is on Facebook. And, of course, uh, Try of Sharp has got a Facebook site. Uh, Pex for Fun has got a Facebook site as well. So Facebook is one of the places where we now uh, go and place our tools and ensure that the community gets to talk together. Pex for Fun, however, has taken this to a, a greater level of um, social experience. They felt that since there was this gaming aspect of trying to match whether you were um, hitting the program that was underlying there, this could be turned into a game. And so they have coding duels. So now you can see that there's this little ex um, logo up there called coding duels. And when you have solved one of these coding duels, you then get uh, points and marks and so on. And so there's a leaderboard. So it's actually fun and engaging. One of the interesting things about this is you cannot cheat. So there's no copying of code from somebody else or anything. You, you are playing against the computer. The computer knows what the correct answer is, and you have to hit that correct answer with the code that you devise. And then there is a, a game board. This is the online board, which we could show you. Um, if we had this up, but it doesn't matter, uh, which we could show you. And continuously, th minute by minute throughout the day, if you go to Pex for Fun and go to this um, online feed, you'll see that people are playing. When they get the little cross swords, it means they've won a, won a duel. That means they've solved a problem. So it's a great community there. There's a leaderboard. It says uh, thousands and thousands of uh, Problems have been solved. In fact, I think we're over 700,000, Nikolai. 900,000 have been solved now. And so people are using this from all over the world. It's a great place to go and engage in order to improve your programming skills. But remember, my talk's not about programming. It's about the software engineering that's supporting a social experience for um, worldwide stuff. So I would have given you a demo, but don't worry about it. You can get the demo over at the Demo Fest on... Uh, no, you can't. Pex for Fun is not being shown. We'll see if we can still get there. Lastly, social aspects in the large. This is work which was done by um, an intern last year. So one of the biggest code bases in Microsoft is Bing. Bing is our search engine, and it has over one million change sets or branches of code. That's a lot, right? So each of those con con can contain over 200,000 check-ins and 700 branches, 6 million different files. Look at the numbers. I mean, these things are just out of scale that you would have imagined, right? It's almost impossible to crawl this thing incrementally. So the techniques that Tony was explaining about branch analysis yesterday almost fall over when you're doing this kind of thing. So what happened was that researchers at the University of Washington invented this new way of doing things by using probabilities. They said that they could predict whether or not a particular branch was going to be checked in or not checked in at a certain time. They won a prize for that paper last September, and the intern who was helping them work on it came to work for us, and we got him to work on this Bing code. So it's called speculative analysis, and it predicts what users might do in certain circumstances. And then we, they can store the results, and if the user does choose to do it, we present the pre-calculated information that we worked out 
at the beginning. If the user doesn't choose to do it, it doesn't matter. We were just using spare computer cycles to work out all this stuff anyway. But the information doesn't need to be saved. I mean, doesn't need to be used. It's just saved in case you need it. Yeah. Oh, what? We've got that. Okay. I think we've got one more. Right. So there are two more on this, and then we can do the demo. So this is the same kind of um, uh, diagram that Tony showed you, where people are checking out um, branches of code. And then if you see, they started checking things out on about the 10th of the month. And on the 24th, two weeks later, they find they've got a conflict. Well, that's a problem. If they could have found that conflict earlier or found out that they would have had a conflict, things would have been a lot more efficient. So with this um, system, we can do that. Sorry, let's go back. You can see that red arrow over there. With our system, it warns you. It doesn't actually do anything. It just warns the people through a social engineering uh, aspect on Visual Studio through a plugin that there might be a problem, and this is how it works. Down here in this bottom section, it works out and it notifies the particular user through the pictures of the people that are working on the problem and says, you know, you might have problems with your files with these people who are also working on the same file down the road. So it's a predictive warning analysis system based on all that code. Uh, very, very clever. Hopefully it will be released soon and it will be actually um, available. It's currently being uh, beta tested within the Bing group. So, all right, we want to do our demo. Let's do that quickly. Are we all ready? It doesn't matter if it doesn't work. It's okay. Don't worry about it. We've actually got enough to talk about. All right. <laughs> so the, the last thing that is relevant here is software development kits. So not everything runs in a browser. I'm sure you've already realized that. After all, browsers are limited. So we do need to have some more robust type of software which is available more generally to people. And in my group, we've got quite a lot of this going on. In fact, we've spearheaded several software development kits. The one is called Project Hawaii, and this is for doing mobile um, uh, computing in the cloud. And Victor Ball uh, told you about that yesterday. So there are services which you could get on your phone and they can be executed in the cloud like optical character recognition, speech to text and so on. And those are available in terms of a library which uh, they've written and which we promote. Just to mention one thing there is that Project Hawaii is also an outreach program and you, we loan phones to people all around the world. So if you would like to use that, uh, but you don't have Windows phones in your particular university, you can write to us and we can set you up with a phone loan program. So that's quite fun. Talk to me afterwards. The other one is Connect. Now, obviously, Connect, as Peter Lee said, is one of our huge success stories. And following on from the launch of Connect, there was also the launch of a software development kit where you could yourselves, through um, uh, a library of routines, uh, make things on top of Connect. And that software development kit is also available. And it's available to academics. It's now available more widely as well, and you can get that. Finally, there's something called WebNGram, and WebNGram is a way of getting content and modeling types available um, through the web. So I'm going to end up now by showing you a couple of slides on this. 
We've talked about large programs. Large programs are things that we mine, but large data is also something that we mine. And this is a large amount of data taken from Bing. And if you look on the left there, you'll see that if we access that data in a cloud and count how many times uh, various words are used, you'll see that you get a certain type of a cloud. So the word data there was used a lot more than others and inventory and release and so on. But what's more useful sometimes, really, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Yeah, just leave it. I'm going to be fine. Thank you. No problem. So the, if we collect some of these words together, depending on how the data has been um, accessed recently, what we get more is these kinds of clouds, the one on the right. So release inventory data is in fact what we really wanted because that was the kind of um, information that was stored there rather than just the ind individual words. What's very important these days is linked data, data which is linked up in various domains. So these are all websites and data curation sites which are available under publications, online activities, music over there, geography, cross-domain, life sciences. How does one make sense or even access all of this data? So two things. One is that we do something called a concept search. So when you search for data, you can search by means of some or other concept. And that comes in and looks at whether you're searching not just for the textual word, but via a certain context. So you can see we're searching for the word company, and it'll give us a whole lot of companies. Google, IBM, Microsoft, etc., Cisco. But if we search for the word company in terms of what does the word company mean, then it says legal entity, organization, and so on. Or it could talk about types of world-famous companies, massive companies, big-name vendors, and so on. And lastly, we can also do this, and this is uh, through Bing now these days, you can find, whether you want to find out film's budget, you can actually get tables coming out. And there's an enormous amount of work going on in the back of Bing to produce this kind of table through those linked data um, as setups. So it's getting the semantics of the data in advance, working out what it is that you wanted through the film's budget. It's not just coming back with a Wikipedia thing that says films and budget. It's understanding what it was that you really, really wanted and comes back with a table of that sort. Now, how do, do I and my group try and help you to be the next group of people who are going to do this uh, work with us, which we would love? Well, we've got these CIF awards, and as you can see, we've got um, quite a few that have come out of LATAM, and we would like to have more. We give 25,000 US dollars, that's a seed funding, and not only that, but there is an invitation usually each year starting this year to come to a CIF day where you meet the Microsoft researchers, work with them for a day, discuss future projects and so on in software engineering. We also go out to uh, conferences, to the major conferences such as ICSI. We have a workshop called TOPI and the next one is coming up in two weeks time in Switzerland where we discuss special issues related to this kind of work that I've been describing. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that software engineering, from my point of view, is really analytic these days. It's not just a process that we go through, which it was when I learned how to do it long ago. It's now something where you've got to analyze data, understand data, and work through the next uh, um, steps dealing with that huge data. It's also technology transfer thoughts from the point of view of companies. It's no good just putting out 
systems there and saying, you're going to like this. You're going to love it. Use our systems. We need to work with you and find out what it is that really works. And I think Try of Sharp, which will be my demo uh, on Friday, is one of those where we really try to understand how F Sharp might be something that academics might or might not use. And so that was a, a win. And then finally, the social media aspects. Young people of today really make use of social media in a huge way. And in fact, old people do as well. You can find Peter Lee on uh, Facebook, and very soon you're going to be able to find Tony Hay on Facebook, we hope. And the um, social media is a way of understanding the way that other people work. It's a way of connecting up and ensuring that we can get feedback and handle forums. And of course, special social media, such as the ones built into Pex for Fun, are exceptionally good. So I'd like to leave there, and perhaps there will be um, one question while the next speaker gets hooked up. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Judith. Any questions? Okay, here. The mic. Hi. Uh, I've been teaching uh, computer science all my, all my life. And I wonder if you have an advice for how do you prepare a professional uh, so that uh, he or she can be uh, in, this, in this new world of, of doing software engineering? Wow, that's a great question because I was faced with it for many years myself. I think. I did two things that may be of use to you. The first one is I tried not to be dogmatic about any type of software. So that was, I said to the students that if you're going to be a professional out there, don't say, I only use Linux. Don't say, I only use Microsoft. Keep your eyes open, keep your uh, um, skills adaptable all the time. Make sure you can put everything on your computers, keep yourself fresh, read what's coming up, make sure you are uh, up to speed on everything. That's the one thing. The second thing is to try as far as possible in the university context, which is not always um, easy, to put bigger projects in front of uh, students. Uh, sometimes it's possible to link up with local, local companies and that's the greatest thing you can do because they tend then to get a flavor of what's going on. There is time for more questions while the next speaker is getting ready. No more questions? Who is the next speaker? Nikolai. Okay, so thank, thank you very much, Judith. Okay. <laughs>